Hello and welcome everyone to episode 19 of the Gretsch Afternoon Drum Break. I am your host, Mr. Neil LaFortune, all the way from the new drum room in Aurelia, Ontario, Canada. So excited to be out here. We have a few things to be put away here, but I will definitely do a little bit of a video tour. I am so excited to have our guest on today, Victor Andrezzo. He was born in Freeport. Long Island. He is known as a session musician, playing with such artists as Scott Weiland, Chris Cornell, Queens of the Stone Age, Beck, Macy Gray, Daniel Lanois, Willie Nelson, Avril Lavigne, Gwen Stefani, plus soundtracks like Get Him to the Greek, Crazy Stupid Love, Diary of a Wimpy Kid, Spider-Man, Charlie's Angels, Super Bad, Matrix Reloaded, Thank you, Mr. Victor Andrezzo, for being here today and on episode 19 of the Gretsch Afternoon Drum Break. How are you doing? I'm doing great. How are you? I'm doing all right. Do you remember all of those things that we, we talked about? You remember, you probably have, well, yeah, maybe that session was a long time ago. I, I vaguely remember when you hear it on the radio or you hear it somewhere, you're like, oh, yeah, I forgot I did that. It must be cool. Sometimes, yeah, there. Uh, you know, hear some something, and I go, "Oh man, I, I that sounds familiar," and then it kind of comes back. You know. Yeah, that's that's awesome. What a career you've had thus far, and I appreciate you taking the time. I know that you're busy right now, doing projects, and 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 this is great, and and I'm happy. So, what has happened with you since COVID started? Well. Initially, uh, I was sharing a studio space with a bass, great bass player, Sean Hurley, and a great engineer, Chris Steffen. And we just had lost that building. Uh, and at the time, that seemed kind of devastating. And then COVID hit. And so I had to figure out how to work. So I basically ended up converting my garage and taking all the stuff from the studio and, and doing that here. And that's actually been pretty empowering uh, because it was such a learning curve all of a sudden to like, you know, I hadn't touched Pro Tools in, I don't know, 10 years. And then to like have to do all of that stuff. But really, I, I'm very fortunate in that I have a lot of engineer friends. And <laughs> yeah, and so I could record stuff and send it to them first and be like, hey, you know, can you check the phase for me and make sure this is all right? And uh, I just really wanted to make sure there was a high... Uh, high standard of quality that way if people send me tracks and I send them stuff back that it sounds great it has to be great wow and how long did it take you to get up and running from the time you left that studio to where you are now it probably took a good month really that's uh, pretty quick cool, really I yeah guess. it is but I was like man I gotta figure something out you know it was uh <laughs> like a lot of us it's like okay I gotta pivot and that's really you know, being a musician for a living, I think that's one of the biggest things you need to learn is like how to pivot, right? It's like it things aren't going to go exactly the way you had planned or envisioned. So like, okay, what's, let's go here. Let's do this. And, and, and you, you do need to think on your feet. You need to then exactly, that's exactly the best uh, word for that is, is to pivot. And you really do need yeah. to. Awesome. Now, Let's go back to the very beginning. Your your story is, is pretty incredible. You you grew up in Long Island, was it? You you were born in Long Island. Did you yeah. grow up there? Uh, you know, not really. I moved out to California when I was 10. Okay. Uh, and, and I was pretty excited to come to California because as a kid reading a lot of the, the album jackets, I saw a lot of records were made here in California in Los Angeles. And matter of fact, one of the very first things I did as a 10 year old is I, I looked in the phone book, maybe some people will remember phone books, but I, I looked up Capitol Records mm -hmm. and I called them and I asked, oh, the receptionist answered and I, I asked her how much it is to make a record. And she kind of laughed and she goes, it's really expensive, honey. And I go, well, then how much to make a 45? Oh. <laughs> I really, I was pretty excited because I, even as a young kid, I knew I, I was obsessed with reading the liner notes. And I, you know, just to be here where all, a lot of the action was, I was pretty excited. That's crazy. Who are your first drum influences? 
I mean, really, I would have to say Ringo. Uh, I remember on the drive, actually, even from New York to California, we, I made my, my parents and my family listen to Sgt. Pepper over and over. Uh, him and really, like, I grew up, I, I was really lucky. My mom was into a lot of different kinds of music and really a lot of old soul music. And it's funny, I really, I listen to the same stuff now. Right. My tastes really haven't changed very much. Uh, right. And I keep going back to the same things. There's still, you can hear a song. I, there's some songs that I've heard a million times. And on any given day, all of a sudden you, you hear something new, you know, right. or. Right. Uh, Especially the Beatles records, really. Like, it's like, yeah. you ever heard that with a different set of headphones or different, yeah. in a different acoustic environment? That's pretty yeah. amazing. Now, did, when, did you, when did you start playing drums? Uh, you know, my mom told me that it, she'd give me a drum at a year old. <laughs> uh, and I really, I was just obsessed with drums. I used to get a lot of toy drum sets for Christmas. And I, I had brothers who would smash them. I think they were sick of hearing <laughs> me bang on them. Uh, but and I don't think I got a real kit until maybe sixth or seventh grade. I had a pretty crappy little kit. And uh, yeah, just I had pieces of drums. I, I don't even think I got a really good kit until uh, I was 20 or so, something like that. I borrowed wow. friends drums and I was, you know, but not I, it, it took me a long time. And so I really it made me really appreciate what I have. Yeah, uh, that's really good. A lot of kids yeah. now, th they want a Gretsch set. I want the yeah. F10. I want, yeah. I want that, and I, you know, but it's good the delayed gratification. And we are yeah. all exactly the same age according to Wikipedia, so yeah. I know what that's like. We didn't get things handed to us, right? No. Which, which is really good. Did you do lessons, or were you playing to to records? What was the deal? Just records. Uh, yeah, my, my family was, was pretty poor. My, really, you know, I was raised by a single mom. And so we didn't have the money for that. I, I did take band in junior high, uh, which really, I had a great teacher. And that really left a big impact on me. Uh, and then it, by high school, I kind of got out of it because I was already starting to play in bands. And I didn't have time for that, uh, which... I, would, I wish that I had stuck with it and stuck with reading because that would become so important later on. Yeah. Uh, wow. That is what it, did you learn from your, the, the grade school teacher that, that was so influential to you. What did you learn? Well, he, he did the best thing for me because uh, I, when I first started playing in band, I, I made up my own drum parts. And he kind of pulled me aside and he goes, you know, that's really cool what you're playing. And I'll let you play it, but you have to be able to write it out. Wow. Uh, and so I, I did do that. Um, uh, I did write it out. Uh, and then, you know, promptly forgot it right after that, junior high. And then as a, as a grown man, when I started getting calls to do uh, movie sessions, I pretty much had to relearn everything. And then to do that, I really, I reached out to a couple of friends, drummers, and then took some lessons from them and got a, there was a great app on the phone called uh, Read Rhythm. And okay. I would just play along to that and got some drum books. And, but uh, yeah, I, I wouldn't say I'm the greatest reader, but I can sight read. And, you know, to do movie sessions, you, you have to have that, that yeah. skill set. I've never done a movie session. So there's not a whole lot of movie uh, session work up here and I'm in cottage country an hour and a half north of Toronto so I'm kind of kidding yeah. but I, I can't imagine the pressure is there a little bit of pressure when you're in it a, a lot of pressure matter of fact I, I, I rarely get any sleep the night before oh, because man. there's something you know some people reading comes very naturally to them uh, but I'm not really a thinking player I play from the heart uh, and, and want to just feel stuff but when you're reading and you've got to read stuff, and especially odd time signature stuff, it uh, there's this thing where your head's tilted and you're reading the chart and you're trying to like you know do all of this. Uh, yeah, it's it's nerve wracking, and you have to get it right. You have to be good right out of the gate, or or you won't. You're not going to be called back. You know. Do you get the parts ahead of time? Like reading it for the first time when you're there. 
Not anymore. Now it's like uh, I sight read it there. The very first big movie that I did, uh, I did ask for the charts ahead of time. I, I, I started getting movie sessions because I had done a 40 year old virgin with my friend Lyle Workman. And <laughs> that was there was no reading. We were just playing, you know, he would we would come up with stuff. And so then when composers started calling me the first guy, I just told him I was like, hey, I'm not a great reader. I haven't read in years, but if you send me the charts, I'll study them and I'll, I'll get it. And then from there, I just, I knew that I couldn't keep doing that. And so I just, I really put a lot of time into like trying to learn it and figure it out. Yep. Yep. That is amazing. Now I know I've done an awful lot of reading early on before I actually did any reading gigs. It was probably 10 years of playing along with, you know, the Weckl play along charts or, or whatever. And then I go to, to do an Elvis tribute show. And this is like, this is really cool. It's right there. And yeah. probably 30 years old or 30, early 30s by the time I ended up doing it. But it's a lot of fun. And certainly nowhere the pressure of playing, uh, you know, on a soundtrack. Could you imagine, you know, having a colossal error <laughs> during oh, yeah. uh, a cutting? Uh, that would be I, I've had some. I, I had one that was a nightmare, actually. Oh, yeah? One. Yeah. I had one. It, it was like uh it was for some animated movie and the whole day i was i was really proud of myself because i was uh sight reading my ass off i was like killing it getting all the cues and then the very last cue of the day was these time signatures i had never even seen and i didn't even i couldn't wrap my head around it and so i ended up having to punch in and it was it was t it was horrific it was horrifying but yeah and we yeah. relive those, or I know I do relive any little glitch. You're like, oh man, and yeah. Go, you know, it's hard. That is awesome. We have a question here saying, can you talk about your special tambourine that you have? <laughs> Gosh, <laughs> I wonder which one. I, it might be this one. This might my. It's uh, an old '40s guy. Yes. Uh, and it's really, uh, I, I think, I hope this is the one he's talking about. Uh, yeah. yeah, I just like, uh, I've been obsessed with collecting old tambourines or weird tambourines. Sometimes I like to use like uh, kids tambourines, little toy ones that sound, you know, I'm always looking for different kind of odd sounds, especially now where so many of the sessions you come in and there's a lot of programming. And right. people like in the 2000s, Right. People wanted it. You would have the song would be there would be a lot of programming. But then all of a sudden the real guy shows up on the chorus. Right. Uh, right. Like that, yep. The Avril Lavigne stuff or stuff yep. like that. Uh, and now it's not really like that. Now it's more about sounding like you're you're programmed or you're a drum machine. And so I'm always looking for odd sounds and odd percussion. Uh, I make a lot of percussion. OK. Uh, shakers, weird shakers. I let my favorite ones are are these I make out of moon gel boxes and I put in like uh, rivets or screws and stuff like that. But you get this cool, I don't know if you'll hear it, but uh, that is you, can make, you can make accents and stuff like that. Just yeah. all, always well, looking for sounds, you know? Yeah, I know a lot of classical percussionists, they'll have quite the collection of, of different, oh, yeah. you know, that is really amazing. Yeah, there's a guy, one of the, the top guys here for movies is this guy, Brian Kilgore, who is incredible and very gracious. And anytime I've been on sessions with him, he's always showing me some new trick. He, he taught me how to bow a cymbal with a violin bow. And like, uh, he's always got some little trick or some little piece of percussion and he makes stuff and is always very generous and uh, happy to like show me how to do stuff and that is awesome I, 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 yeah. my and, and in general are, are definitely uh, uh the type of people that are here let me show you i want to show dom famulero used to talks about yeah. that all the time let me show it to you in slow motion you know yeah very giving um i wanted to talk about so your your early playing you were playing in bands when you were in your high school days is that when when that happened yeah. And then, you know, I at 17 uh, kind of ran away to Hollywood and joined a band and that band got signed. And yeah, I, I wanted to be a band guy like that was my thing. And then 
in the 90s, mid 90s, maybe uh, a lot of like after Green Day hit, there were all those kinds of punk rock bands getting signed. And a lot of those drummers couldn't play to a click track. So I would get called to play on those records and sometimes ghosting uncredited and sometimes credited. Uh, but yeah, play, you know, playing to a click. And I, I remember reading that very early on in like a modern drummer magazine. There was like a drummer round table and all of them were talking about the importance of playing to a click and how you could play behind the click. You could play with the click. You could play on top of the click for different sections of a song to make it still feel good. And so pretty early on, I, I got hip to that. And, and especially before I made my very first record with this band, I, I wanted to make sure I wasn't going to get replaced. Yeah. So I really like, I, I did my homework with the click and, that is amazing. Did you record yourself playing with the click? Could you tell? Because it sometimes is hard to tell if you are behind it or if you're still sort of on it. And did you play work on playing the kick and the snare behind or ahead? Or how did you practice that? Well, I, I don't even know that I got to practice it so much, except that I would a lot of my practicing a lot of times, but especially at that time, I was living in an apartment, so I didn't have access to to do stuff and there was it wasn't as easy to record yourself as yep. it is now uh so a lot of the stuff and i still do it to this day i practice in my head and i kind of visualize it and i would go to sleep with a metronome and as i was falling asleep i would imagine myself playing different variations i play halftime stuff or play imagine playing slightly behind it or all of that and uh, for a lot of things in my life, when I can do that, when I can visualize it, it just is so much easier when I sit down to do something. I honestly don't spend a lot of time playing by myself at the kit because it just, I get bored to tears. I just can't do it. I like playing with other people. And really the only time I'll sit and practice is uh, maybe if I'm on the road, I'll have a practice pad. And then during baseball season here, I sit with a practice pad and I'll, watch a baseball game and, and practice on the pad. But that, that is other funny. than that, it, it's just, but there is something every time. And I used to do it a lot early on when I would record something, I would want to come in the control room and hear it. And I would ask the engineer if it was okay, if I just heard me myself in the click so I could kind of gauge what was going on. Uh, That's yeah. awesome. And it's so much easier. We can record with a zoom. You can record just with a basic, yeah. Overhead mic or the EAD and the Yamaha thing you can record and you can you can work on stuff like that, but you yeah. can't work on playing with people solitarily, you know, you have, you have yeah. to play with people. That's a whole other ball game, right? Uh, and then playing live and now playing live. A lot of times there's people play you play to a click live and then all of a sudden you, you have to learn how to manage your adrenaline, right? Yeah. And even if you're playing to a click, the most interesting thing is on any given night, it's the same tempo, but one day it feels really fast and the next day it feels really slow. So you just have to like uh, adjust to that and learn how to, that, that was the biggest thing playing live is like learning how to manage adrenaline. Right, I, I agree, I agree. Now, when you're playing live with a click and or tracks, do you try and bury the click or do you maneuver behind and ahead of it? Uh, honestly, I don't think about it that much to tell you the truth the, the click for me has always been something that it has to be, it has to be there and I have to feel it, but I, I don't want to be thinking about it. Right. So again, I want to like, so this is the thing too, right? A lot of people complain like, Oh, if you play to a click, it's going to feel stiff. Right. I, I don't want that. I want to still react to the emotion of the song and the feeling of the song. So the click or a loop or stuff like that is there, uh, but I'm not thinking about it. And then if the song calls for it to feel back in a section, I'll just do that. It's just kind of now just becomes something that's just ingrained in me. Yeah. 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 I find that I turn the click down a lot of times so that I don't hear it. Yeah. And then I feel if it's wandering, I'm going to turn it up a little bit, but that's really great. It just becomes a member of the band that's got really good time. Yeah, exactly. You know? I mean, for me, like, I like to have the drums very low or almost non-existent in a mix because, yeah. and I've said this before, but like music should be a conversation. 
and communicating with somebody. And if I'm thinking about what I'm doing or what I'm going to say, then I'm not listening. That's wonderful. Man, this is such great, great insights from someone that's got a lot of experience. Was being a session musician a goal or was it something that just kind of happened? No, I, 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 matter of fact, I just never thought that I could be good enough to do that. Uh, and I just think, uh, yeah, yeah, it was just something after playing, you know, being good at playing with a click uh, and then also having a pretty wide palette of like styles that I could play. I just found myself getting asked to record more and more. And then that just kind of snowballed into what it is. It's ridiculous reading your partial list of credits. And I can't not believe the variety that you play from live tracking with Willie Nelson to playing with Chris Cornell and 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 soundtracks it is it must be so amazing to play all the different kinds of music because you're constantly stimulated by doing new and different things right yeah oh absolutely that that's the best thing about the job and and i and to tie this all in with gretch and gretch drums and why i love gretch drums is because Nine times out of 10, I don't even, I show up somewhere, I get a call to go record. I have no idea what the music is going to be. Uh, and I know with uh, my, my Gretsch kits that I could do anything. There's, there's nothing, no scenario where they're not going to be right. And I've learned over the years how to treat them and, you know, either tape them up or leave them wide open or whatever it is that they will be, you know, right for the job. And, and really the first time I got to use a Gretsch kit was uh, on a session and I was with a cartridge company here in LA, Drum Paradise at the time. And they had one of Kurt Mascara's Gretsch kits. And I was just asking them, I'm like, man, I, you know, at the time I, I don't even remember what drums I had, but nothing really that was record ready. Uh, and they said, oh, we got you. We have, they had a stop sign badge kit, uh, like a, it was either late 70s, early 80s kit, which is still what I use. Uh, and there it was, right? The session, and it, it was right every time. Every That's time. amazing. Yeah. The first, now, I see you're, you're, you did the video for the new uh, Gretsch Brooklyn Standard snare drum. Yeah. And from the video, I gathered that you normally would put a lot of things on top of the drum head to muffle it and to get different sounds out of it. But with the built-in muffler, you don't need to do that. You can adjust yeah. them. Need be. That looks awesome. It's really an amazing drum. And I, I, it's funny because for years, I was only using like a, a bell brass be, just because of the wide range of stuff you could do with that. And But that, that Brooklyn standard is incredible and just has a whole other character aside from the bell brass. And really, I would say those are the two drums that I use. That's amazing. What, let, let's tell the listeners, what is the, the Brooklyn Standard Drum? What, what is the shell? Uh, I think, it, you know, I don't even know what it is, to tell you the truth. I think it might be, is it mahogany? I'm not sure. I have it, I but it's have a, it around here. It's, it's a wood a, shell, yeah. Uh, and, yeah, so one wood shell and one metal, one brass snare, and I can, I can do whatever that, I need to do, that, really. That bell brass is, is a dream drum for me, and that'll, that'll yeah. eventually end up in here and you didn't you don't find that the bell brass was too loud for certain things no and especially the way i would treat the way i treated i the bell brass i primarily use very low and super dead I, I i have the head almost as low as it can go and then i have you know maybe a richie ring and some moon gels and then i even like to put a couple pieces of paper on the top of the snare wow uh, that's that just gives it so much body uh, but yeah, I don't, I'm primarily, I'm not using it wide open or like, you know, sometimes if it's a rock thing and then they, it doesn't matter how loud, but that's the other thing too, right? You learn as you go through the years is especially for recording how to hit because hitting live and hitting in the studio are two different things, right? Uh, live, you want to hit a little harder or make it look like you're hitting harder. <laughs> uh, and, then in the, and then in the studio, that just doesn't really fly. Uh, and also the times have changed. It is funny, like uh, when I first started doing stuff very early 90s or even late 80s, it was like 
the engineers wanted you to hit harder, you know, but then you had to know right. not to hit the cymbals too hard. And now the way things have changed, it's light, lighter and lighter is definitely. Right. Do you rim shot the snare drum for backbeats or sometimes depending on the tune? Yeah, I, I definitely did that for a long time. I, I, a little of both, a little of both, you know, it depends what the, what the song calls for, you know. That is awesome. So those are your go-to snare drums. What are the go-to drum kits that you're using? I mean, I, I, honestly, for for recording, I have two of the stop sign badge kits. I have one that I keep and then one that ha my cartage guy has. Uh, those are primarily the drums. I have uh, a couple weirder things that I'll have, like a bass drum. I have a Slingerland kit that I use, and now Slingerland is part of the Gretsch DW family, which is awesome. But I have a, a goat head on that bass drum, and it sounds like an 808 and no front head. So when I do things that are more program sounding, I'll use that. Uh, that is cool. But that's really it. And I, have, I do have, I have a Gretsch Catalina 18 bass drum that sounds amazing, uh, and I've used that on a couple recordings. But really, you know, 95% of the time, it's the stop side badge scratches for me. What are the size of those? I have a 22 and a 24. Uh, and then I'll do either a 12 or 13 and a 16. That's it. That's awesome. So a four, always a four-piece setup? Yeah. Yeah, pretty much. Unless I'm doing a concert tom thing, which mm. I was so excited uh, for this upcoming Atlantis tour that hopefully will happen next year. I had them make me a, a concert tom kit, which is 8, 10, I think uh, 12, 13, 14, and a 16, uh, and a 24. And I'm pretty excited about that. I really, there's just something, the era I grew up in with concert yeah. toms, and yeah. I just love the way that sounds. And, and, and on the new Alanis record, there's a lot, I, I use concert toms a lot. That is really amazing, wow. They've definitely made a comeback. I remember being in the factory in Paul Cooper's office and sitting behind his desk or in, in the corner were two concert toms that Taylor Hawkins had mailed back to Gretsch. And I'm like, what are, and he explained to me that, that, that the, the fellow told him, that the artist rep, that he needed to return them. So they're sitting in Paul Cooper's office, which is, right. which is pretty cool. So, oh, that is awesome. Yeah. And, and of course, the Phil Collins era, Hearing those yeah. concert toms, man, that's 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 the sound. I've never played them live, so I'm interested. Yeah, there's something about concert toms too. If you're playing with a track with a lot of programming, <clears throat> and you want it to fit into the track and not sound mm. too too much like a real drum, there's something about the tone of concert toms, especially depending how you treat them. Uh, I like on them really. I love like just pinstripes, and then I put some more. Yeah, I mean, here I can show you right there. Oh. There's some concert toms that there's a lot of stuff on them but they really sound it's a great sound and really fits in great with programming and that's amazing i'll i'll take note of that i have a couple yeah. of my son's concert toms downstairs and it'd be fun just to to see what they sound like mic'd up yeah. Yeah. i wanted to ask you how you got into playing so you, you were doing sessions playing kind of for punk bands or drummers that had no experience playing with a click how did that develop into you being one of the top call session drummers and how, and who were you playing with at, that led to um, some of the A-level gigs? I, I would say a really big break that I could think of was joining Beck and his band. And so I, I did a session where some of his band was on that session. And, uh, and then they told me that it was for Sporty Spice actually. <laughs> uh, her solo album. Oh, wow. And, uh, which I think I got the call from Rick Rubin was producing it. And I think uh, maybe he had heard of me from the Scott Weiland record. And so then I went and I auditioned for Beck. And I think Beck has always been known for having really great uh, musicians in his band. And from that, that really opened a lot of doors in the session world in Los Angeles. After that, like I just started getting a lot of calls and yeah, just, uh, I was, I was very excited to play with Beck as well because his music just had uh, such a wide palette 
of styles. And that was my dream was to be able to play all kinds of different things. So one minute you could be playing kind of punk rock or you could be playing hip hop or something more soulful or like whatever. It's like he had it all and that really, and, and live we were playing to a click, you know? Wow. And, and a lot of loops. And that was really, that, that, that gig was such a big education for me and really prepared me for the rest of my career, I would say. And, and the amazing. guys in that band, it was Justin Meldell Johnson, Roger Manning, Lyle Workman. Those guys were so great and took it so serious. There was never a night of phoning it in. There was, it was always, we have to be great. Let's be great. And there was this kind of pushing of each other to do that. And that was, was invaluable. So I think I was about 30 or so when I, when I got that. Perfect age because you're yeah. matured enough. And but, oh, that's wonderful. How did the Macy Gray gig happen for you? Uh, I had a, a little side band. That's even before Scott Weiland, actually. Okay. Uh, or maybe somewhere around the time, maybe before that stuff came out, even came out. But uh, I had some friends and we had a little instrumental band that was like really like we loved the meters. And so we were playing in that style. And the keyboard player was going to school at the time and he knew Macy, she was a film student. And he's like, man, I know this girl, she's a great singer. And so she came and sang a track with us. And I believe actually that track was the thing that got her signed uh, at, at Sony. Wow. Uh, and you could just hear it. It's funny, I heard it the other day and it's just immediate and her voice is so amazing. And yeah, yeah, we just, we kind of hit it off. Uh, but I, I, you know, was doing other things at the time uh, during her first album. And then, and then by the second album, we kind of reconnected and I ended up doing a bunch of records with her and she was very generous and let uh, the musicians write with her. And I, I loved, I loved playing with her and, and then even playing live. Uh, I play, I did a couple tours with her and it was amazing. There was like huge horn section, tons of backups. There was like 15 people on stage and the energy of that, when it's firing on all cylinders, much like the Beck band is so powerful. And, you know, being the drummer, it's like you're, you're driving the truck. That's incredible. You know? Yeah. It was really fun. Wow. Where did you tour? All over, all over the world, really. Yeah. Amazing. Any favorite yeah. venues? Uh, that you remember from that from those tours well i would say one of my favorite venues uh is in italy really well uh, every venue in italy it, i i have definitely uh there's an artist i got to play with uh there named elisa who was wonderful and there's something uh there, there's a place in Verona, an outside Colosseum that is just so amazing and beautiful. And, and, and playing in Italy, like the people, much like the food and everything, are beautiful, passionate. And I just, I really miss going there right now. I bet you do. That's incredible. Yeah. I've never been to Italy, but would love to go. It looks, it looks amazing. I love Italian yeah. food. If I, if I married an Italian <laughs> woman, I would be... <laughs> Three times it'd be, yeah, I'd be three times. Yeah, I'm actually, I'm looking into my dual citizenship uh, because oh, my, my grandparents are from there okay. and I, I want to get out of the U.S. At, right now, <laughs> you, you know. It's a scary anyway. time. It really is a yeah. scary time. I'm not sure. Do you yeah. have anything, any live things at all? Or is everything that you're doing now um, session work? Well, with Alanis, since the tour got postponed and her album just came out, we've been doing a lot of these at home videos and like uh, concert videos. And that's what I've been working on this week uh, where each guy re records their performance and then I, I will put it together and I'm getting to mix those things, which is pretty fun. Uh, and a whole other skill set that I'm developing. Uh, so that, that's that's pretty good, but yeah, no plans of actually going out into the world until the next summer. <coughs> knock on wood. Uh, I have gone to sessions and studios here, which has really been a trip. Uh, playing with a mask on and the whole bit. Uh, yeah, it's a strange time. Hard to strange read facial expressions, you know, with a mask. Yeah. Your eyes, and so yeah, 
Like, and, is it okay yeah, to be dickhead or? Yeah, and the breathing and like uh, all of it. It's a, it's a trip. I, I know. Imagine you're bleeding into the overheads. Um, Victor, you're you're panting. <laughs> yeah. Wow, that is that is crazy. Wow, I cannot believe that um, it has been that long since people have played. And there was so this was supposed to be such a great year for so many artists, especially, you know, a, a new record from from Alanis. And how did you end up getting to be a part of her project? Uh, it was through a, a friend of mine that we were doing a lot of sessions together at the time, David Levita, great guitar player. Uh, I had actually I had been asked to join her band when I was playing with Macy. And wow. I, I didn't do it because I was pretty happy in the Macy camp. Uh, but then, uh, when her drummer decided to leave, I think it was Blair, Blair Sinta was playing with her at the time. He decided to stay home and, and Dave just told her, he's like, Hey, I have the guy. And, and I really, I, I, I can't even truly put into words how much I love playing with her as a person. Uh, and it's fun. I, I, I don't know. I, She's she's an amazing person. She really gives the musicians a lot of space to be themselves. I love playing on records with her. E everything I would do anything for her all day cool. long. When did you become? Uh, when did you start your association with Cheryl Crow? I think that was well. I actually played guitar for her on a track uh, for a, a movie soundtrack, uh, Big Daddy. We did a cover of Sweet Child of Mine. I had gotten a call for the session and I thought it was to play drums. And again, this was Rick Rubin. And I, I know this must have been a result of the Scott Weiland record because uh, I showed up with drums and he's like, oh no, I, you're playing guitar. And since I had played guitar on that record, then I, I ended up playing guitar on that track uh, for, with her. And then she ended up, I think Scott and I had asked her to play on his record. Uh, and then I was at a session, I think it was 2010 at Henson. And I was walking out and I saw, I was walking down the hall and the producer, I saw a producer was a friend of mine. He goes, he goes, Hey, what are you doing tomorrow? And I go, what do you want me to do? He goes, well, I'm in with Cheryl Crow and she's not very happy with the guy they have in there right now. And then, that was it. I made a record with her and then she asked us to go on tour and, and that was pretty, pretty fun too. And amazing. So let's amazing back up. Man. How long have you been playing guitar? I had no idea that you played guitar. Well, I, you know, the, the funny thing about that is I, I started playing as a teenager and I played a lot until I started doing sessions. And, uh, once you start playing with session guitar players, I started realizing, wow, I'm nowhere. I have no right, no business. And so I still play a little bit, but not, I got, I easily qu and quickly got intimidated by watching guys that really do it. I can imagine. Yeah. Can, who are some of your favorite bass players to play with? Oh God. Uh, Sean Hurley, Justin Meldell Johnson, uh, Kurt Schneider, uh, Cedric Lemoyne from Alanis's band. Uh, Mm -hmm. I like all the guys I get to play. I get to play with a lot of guys. Paul Bushnell, Chris Cheney, like all of them are great. The thing that I love about like uh, uh, a Kurt Schneider or a Sean Hurley is they really play beautifully behind the beat mm -hmm. and they make a drummer sound so big, right? It's, uh, it, it's an interesting thing. It's harder for me to play with bass players that play in front of me or on top, but uh when they when they are leaning back, it's just like a, this beautiful wide sound, and, and you never have to have. I like in any scenario, guitar player, keyboard player. I like people where you don't have to discuss what's going on. You just yeah. know, and there's kind of an unspoken thing, and you know how to go about it and, and get things done. If I have to think about playing with somebody or where I'm going to put something, then it's just yeah, it's it's not as fun. Then it's work, and then you're thinking rather than feeling. Yeah. That's, we have a question here. Have you ever worked with Rick Beato? I'm, I'm assuming you know who he is. I, I do know who he is. I have not. I would I would love to. Yeah, uh, I've got to see some of his amazing YouTube stuff uh, through my. 
Yeah, he, I, yeah, no, I would love to sometime, hopefully. That'd be fun, Rick, if you're out there. Yeah. <laughs> we'll try and, and fit it in into your crazy schedule. Um, what are some uh, funny or memorable gig stories that you can share with this PG audience? Gosh, I, you know, so, I, there's so many, I don't know. And it's really, uh, each one is so special because the thing that I've always tried to do is like not take what I do for granted. And I always remember the, my 10 year old self and how thrilled he would be to be able to do what I get to do. And so each one is so special in a, in a different way. I always try to take time before I play, be it a session or be it a concert. And I just say thank you to the universe. And I really try to be in the moment. And it's funny, that's really the, some of the only times in my life where I can really be in that moment. And that's what I love about music so much. I'm not thinking about the past. I'm not thinking about the future. I'm in the moment and I'm just responding to what's there. And that beautiful interaction live with people. I, I keep thinking about when we get to go back to playing live and how yeah. emotional that's going to feel. It's really going to, I'm like, I know I'm just going to be crying like a baby. I know, I, I know. It. Yeah. Yeah. It's, I, I can't wait till the, I've done some local outdoor shows and they're, they're really fun, but it's not the theater show that I play in the, in the tribute uh, world that I live in for, for the majority of it. And I miss that family. And I know we all miss our musical families and, yeah. and that, that is amazing. I wanted to ask you, um, what drums would you advise a young drummer who is maybe about 18, 19 years old? What would you advise them to buy if they were going to be looking for something versatile to play in the pop rock kind of genre? Yeah, I would say I really love the, the Gretsch Catalina line, right? I, and all the sizes, it's funny, when you think of the Catalinas, a lot of people think of the jazz sizes, right? But right. they make them in all sizes. I have a kit, uh, a Catalina kit that's 24, 13, 16, and it's mm -hmm. great. So I would just say it really depends on your budget, right? If you could afford to, I would, you know, I would find an old stop sign badge, Gretsch badge kit online somewhere, but those kind of tend to be a little pricey right now. So I, I would say it's kind of budget dependent, right? Uh, but I've always been of the school of thought that the drums don't matter that much to... It, it, you could make any drum sound good is what I'm trying to say, uh, you know, with what you do to the heads. And that's kind of how I ended up coming up with so much stuff uh, to get different sounds because I always had the worst drums, <laughs> just terrible. And so I was like, man, what can I do? And it was a lot of experimenting with different things. Uh, but I would say, especially for if you're on a budget, those, the Catalinas are great and, and you can use them. I use them, I've used them recording, you know. That's crazy. But I, I'd say it's really about if you're not happy with the sound of your drums, then you need to like mess around with di what the different things you could do with heads, right. be it muffling or a different kind brand mm -hmm. of head or. Right. You know. What is your head of choice for toms, for tom batters? And do you have a tuning method, a specific tuning method that you use? Uh, you know, for me, I, I'm a Remo guy. I always have loved Remo. I use on my toms, I use coated emperors. And the thing I like about the coated emperor is again, you can do so many things. And what I try to do really is I, I tune them as low as they'll go where they really hold a nice fat sound of pitch. And then it, it's just amazing. Like with an emperor, then I have such a wide range of tuning. If I need to tune it up high, it's going to hold the tuning because of that thick head. Right. Uh, mm -hmm. Generally, I'd say, yeah, I just try to get them as low as I can. That's, I love, but yeah, with a, with a coated emperor for me, I have this, this great range. And then for snare drums, I love the coated CS dot that like, I just, same thing, you know, it's a, uh, it's a thicker head. Uh, and I, and then I just have such, there's such a wide range. A lot of people, uh, I do like on the, on the Brooklyn standard snare, I have an ambassador. And yes. I like that for that drum. That's really great. Uh, mm -hmm. 
but I, yeah, CS dots for me. And what about the bottom head, the rezzo heads for Toms? What are, what are on those? Uh, I believe ambassadors. Do you tune them the same pitch or do you tune them? Depends. Uh, depends. Yeah. Generally, generally close. Okay. It depends. I think a lot of times you have to figure out what the drum, where the drum wants to sing, right? They usually will have a nice sweet spot. You have to learn that. You have to spend some time with it and see where it, where it wants to live. It'll, it'll tell you. Right. It seems a lot of students, I teach a fair bit in, in the, I just moved into this space, teach a lot and, and students always will say, my drums sound terrible. Let's, I, I don't want it to, to turn any of the lug screws. And I'm like, let's do it. Let's do it right now. And then I'll show them. And then I'm, they, I said, experiment. You can't, you know, yeah. you can't do anything wrong. You can always go back and, and, and it's indefinitely experimenting with different heads and with yeah. different tunings, the bottom head tighter or, or the same. Yeah. That is wonderful. Yeah, that's what, the great thing about drums and the sounds, right? It's also, it's a, it's a flavor to taste. Like what might sound good to one guy is not going to sound good to another guy. I, matter of fact, there's people that like always kind of, uh, they, they hate seeing any kind of muffling on a drum. They're like, you're ruining the drum, blah, blah, blah. It's, like, well, you, you probably haven't recorded or like, you know, had to deal with all that stuff. But it's a flavor to taste. Everybody has their own style and their, their things that they like. Yes. What do you have in the bass drum? Generally, uh, generally uh, I'll have maybe uh, a small pillow and maybe sometimes a towel that I can move. Either sometimes I'll take it completely off the head and just put it in the center. Uh, and then other times I can muffle it. However, you know, same thing. And sometimes it's fun with the smaller drums to not have anything. An 18 or a 20, like I wouldn't put anything on it. Maybe, mm -hmm. maybe a felt strip or something like that. But, but awesome. that's a whole other skill set. Like playing an 18 or 20 or a 26 wide open and learning how to pull the beater off the head, right? Because mm -hmm. on an open drum like that, you can't bury the beater. It'll just sounds terrible yes yeah. yes when i did drum lessons early on there were 18 inch bass drums felt strips no no head or no hole cut in the rezzo yeah. and it was hey you have to let that beater come on and that was a whole other skill it was it was good to learn that early on yeah you know? that's a great thing i there, i run into a lot of guys that have trouble with that or didn't learn that even guys that have been working right. and so sometimes guys will come to me and work on, work on that. Do you teach, do you do lessons at all in the uh, copious amounts of spare time that you have? Uh, I do, it's funny, I've given more lessons since uh, the whole pandemic thing started, doing Zoom lessons, which wow. really, generally I would say they're guys that are already working. Uh, yeah. It's not really somebody just starting out. And then we really are talking more about concepts and how to approach things than actually physically playing. We right. talk about, you know, things like tuning the drums or different sounds or the approach to something because the real skill set of, if you're talking about a session musician is to walk into something, hear a song one time, be able to make a chart. Generally, if it's like a pop session, they're not going to hand you the music. So you make your chart. And then you have to go and play it like you've played that song your whole life. Uh, and so that's the skill set. Have a, do you ever go blank or you're thinking, what am I going to play? Or do you always have a concept when that red light goes on? Yeah, I, I feel like I have. I'm, I'm, I've been very lucky that I generally always have some ideas. And I think more than that, the thing you run into in the studio is that you better have maybe four or five other ideas because maybe what the first thing you think of, maybe the artist or the producer is going to go, no, try something else. So you better have be able to then pivot again and come up with a different thing. Or the, the only times that are really hard is if somebody asks you to do something that's very counterintuitive, right? Which would happen maybe early on, earlier on. But I would say generally now, 90% of the time, somebody that's hired me is going to let me do my thing. That's good. They've hired you for a reason. You have some yeah. and, 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 a, and a great resume. What uh, advice can you give a young drummer if they say, man, I, I've seen what Victor does. I see what 
um, Kurt Vizcarra does or any of these other session drummers, what Vinny, what, what I want to do that. What would, what advice would you give them? If somebody were to say, to have a Zoom lesson with you and say, okay, how do I get into doing what you're doing? Yeah, a lot of people ask that. And there's, there's no clear route, right? It's not like, oh, I'm going to call this guy or meet this guy. It's a series of things. And I think the first thing that has to happen is you have to have your skill set intact, right? You have to be able to play to a click. You have to be able to come up with a variety of different sounds. It's not just walking into a studio, setting up a drum kit and off you go. It's like they might want dead toms. They might want wide open toms or a different sound. And you have to know how to get that sound quickly. Uh, and then it's like interpreting somebody's vision. And for me, that comes more from the heart than the head, right? Uh, and I did learn, there is a great trick that I learned from a, a guitar player, Tim Pierce. Uh, mm -hmm. wa watching him and getting to play with him over the years is he would layer his stuff. And when he was overdubbing, he always started at the chorus. And I asked him why he did that. And he said, well, if I have the chorus, then I know the rest of the song is is." a cake, piece of cake it's like i have it like if i i have to make this chorus happen so a lot of times when i'm overdubbing or even starting i'm thinking about that chorus first and what can i do with percussion or things or what am i going to do that's going to make sure the chorus is the chorus right wow that's, but I, that's... I again and i say it all the time it's like the thing to do also is to know when you're playing on records or even live anything is to play from your heart. Because I think that's the thing that comes across more than anything. And I'll say it a million times, but when we think about putting on some music and we want to listen to it, it's because it makes us feel something. Yeah. And if I'm playing and I'm not feeling something and I'm not trying to put that emotion across, then what's the point, right? Wow, wonderful, wonderful advice. Are there any artists that you have not played with that you would love to? Yeah, I mean, there's, yeah, I guess there's a lot. I mean, I don't know. Uh, Fiona Apple, I suppose. Uh, Stevie Wonder, though I would be too scared. Like that's, he, yeah. he's, he's probably one of my, my biggest heroes just because also his drumming is amazing. Everything he does is amazing. Uh, and somebody so musical like that, that, that would be my dream. Him, okay. him and, well, Ray Charles has passed, but that would have been, he's also one of my favorites. That would have been unbelievable. Victor, thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it. Thank I know you, Neil. You are, you're, you're rammed and um, your body of work is, is, is tremendous. I've been listening to you. <laughs> so <laughs> I, did, I didn't realize, and since becoming a, a Gretsch artist, I was looking to see who was on the roster and I'm like, I keep hearing about Victor and Drizzo. Victor, what has he done? So the last few weeks I've been, been uh, streaming and listening to things that, albums that I know you've played on and man, oh man. And it is, it's, it, to me, it, it helps me get to know you a little bit more and to try and get some background. And, and I can't believe that, like they used to say about Hal Blaine, my five favorite drummers <laughs> were Hal Blaine. <laughs> and listening to you, I didn't know that it was you on so many of these things. So I appreciate Where can people find you on the web? Uh, I suppose Instagram, or I, I guess I have a website too. I think it's called Indrizzo Drums. Uh, yeah. I'm pretty terrible at all of those things, honestly. <laughs> I'm not a good social media guy. and uh, You're too busy. Yeah, well, you know, it's just, uh, yeah. And I'm trying, I'll, I'll get there. But anybody could reach me, I'm, I'm, I'm easy to reach. Yes, yes, and you've been wonderful, and I appreciate you taking the time, and thank you, and I hope you do come to Toronto. I would love to see you with, with any artist and yes. meet you in person. So thank you, everybody, for watching. We have people from Poland, from Brazil, uh, some Italian people, obviously loving that. My people. Everybody, everybody misses, misses you, and so you're doing <laughs> great, Victor. You've got the Instagram game down a lot of <laughs> comments i appreciate That's everybody funny. for tuning in so all the best to you my friend and Same. i i uh i appreciate your time everybody yeah. take care we'll see Thanks. you next on episode 20 thank you thank you Neil. Bye.